Every life has a story, and every story is worth sharing. Your story, my story, and our story speak of victory and defeat, joy and sorrow, resilience and vulnerability. They are not just our story, they are Christ's story in us. They are Kingdom Stories from Down Under. It was May 31st last year when in our church walked a young man with a friend who was attending our church. He came to see what's, what it was all about. He was recovering from addiction and he wanted to start a new life. And that's exactly what he did. And tonight we have the privilege to hear his story. But before that, I just want to mention that this man was behind the cameras and most of the kingdom stories from down under that you watched until now were filmed by him. And this is episode 52 at the end of year 2021. And we're going to finish with a big bang. Uh, having the cameraman uh, being interviewed tonight, not only the cameraman, but a good friend of mine at the moment. We've uh, traveled a long time together since May last year, but uh, we did a lot of life on life. And tonight here at Kingdom Stories, it is an absolute joy to bring to you Paul Mansfield! Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, want a, I, want a, I want a drum beat thank here. You, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Mate, we waited for this moment all our lives. We well, have. at least this, this last year. <laughs> Did you know that I was going to eventually ask you to come on the show? You hinted. You hinted of it, but I was like, oh, I don't know. Maybe next year, season Maybe two. Next year. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't really think of it. But yeah, you definitely hinted of it. So you stayed behind the camera all this, all this year, obviously 2021. <clears throat> and you listened and watched 51 Kingdom stories, testimonies, mm-hmm. firsthand. Yes. I don't know if we have somebody who's watched all of them so far, but you certainly have live. What was it like? It was amazing. Like, um, at first, it was kind of, um, you know, trying to get all the camera. At first, like, it was, I would pay more attention to the, the stories. Oh, you did? Yeah, I would just leave it on the one camera. And oh, you you'd kind of, get sidetracked. I would just get sucked <laughs> into it. Okay. But then as it went on, like, I could learn how to listen while doing the cameras and that. Multitasking. But, but yeah, it was such a, like every, I was kind of reflecting before, like every, after every show, I was just, I felt so full, like just all the experience of everyone um, coming in, like leaders of the church and um, people that have amazing testimonies and stuff like that. And then how the conversation kind of just goes and yeah, yeah I just, every time, there, were, there wasn't one time that I've left. On a, on a Monday night, feeling just full, spiritually full. Like, yeah, it's been such a blessing. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, hopefully this will inspire a lot of people to go through the other episodes that they haven't watched yet. Well, yeah. you've, you've filmed them all live and you've seen them on three cameras and mixing yeah. them live. So well done, well done. And you had no previous um, camera work at all no you, you just picked it up Can along the way <laughs> no i didn't look you know on saturday we 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 just won the championship uh, in soccer and um we were down to 10 men so one of them was red carded and one of our friends who plays with us he's a uh, dutch canadian he said guys you know we got to play as a team. If we're going to win today, we're going to play as a team because we had to win to win the championship and we were down to 10 men. So there wasn't many of us, you know, like you really had to pull, uh, like dig deeper. And he said to us something very important. He said, you know, we got to trust each other. He said, pass the ball, trust the other player that he can handle, he can turn, he can pass. Let's trust each other more with the ball. Mm. Because usually you look for the better player to pass it to whom you know that they're going to do something with that ball. But he said, let's trust each other. And I think that was the lesson for me. And I thought, wow, fantastic. And I thought, that's what we did here as well. Mm, absolutely. We just I, I entrusted you with this and just hoping for the best. But you took that with responsibility. Mm. And that's where we are today. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And that's I think that's a blessing in, um, in working with you is that um, I've found that you kind of, yeah, you do. You do trust. Even you know, knew I have like not much experience with cameras, but you did. You trust. You trust me with it, and then gently kind of guide in. You know when I need it, and 
Yeah, I think it's worked out all right so far. So the, the trick is trust but verify, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And tonight, because you are you are behind the, obviously you're in front of the camera, behind the scenes we have Calvin and uh, maybe one day we will bring him at Kingdom Stories oh, from down under. Calvin does all the editing and all the post-editing and preparation and the low thirds and the intros and the outros and uploading to YouTube and all that. And he's filming tonight and he's editing tonight. Fantastic. Mm. So, I obviously in the introduction, I said a, a little bit about you. Uh, I won't pick it up uh, in May last year when you first came in. I will rewind back to, mm. to when you were little. So, born in Perth? Yes. Yeah, born in Perth. Yep. Uh, in what, what hospital? <laughs> uh, Sterling, uh, there's a hospital in... Osborne Park Hospital. Osborne Park, yeah. Oh, there's right. no, it's no emergency. I don't know. Not but, anymore now. Not anymore, yeah. But so you could book birth. yourself in, I think for for birth. So they had have, they have birth suites, mm. yeah. So I lived there, uh, I lived actually 200 meters from the hospital for seven years. Oh, wow. And my wife worked there. Yeah. So she did a lot of C-sections, but it was long after. Was that in 89? No. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> 89 you were born, eh? Yeah. I was uh, in Australia one year at the time. Oh, wow. So, 1989, born in Sterling. Yeah. How many siblings? Um, so, I have one, so my, an older sister. Nice. Um, and then I have kind of half brothers and sisters as well. Okay. Yeah. So, um, an older sister from same mum. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what area did you grow up um, in? So, like northern suburbs of Perth. Okay. Uh, Coastal. Not not at first. Like I started off in Hammersley, Balcatta, I think. Yeah. I mean, that's my earliest memories. Is Are you back there now? Yeah. Balcatta. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Funny, Dad. Yeah, yeah. And I like it. I like that area. It's living in Balcatta now. It's actually really close to the city. It's close to the beach. It's not... Not the closest to the beach. It's probably a little but bit close too enough. far. Close enough, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I went to Hammersley, primary. Glendale Primary School. Oh, nice. In um, in Hammersley. And do you actually remember your first day of school? I do. You do? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What marked you so much on that first day? I met um, a guy, my um, like a, a mate that I'm still friends with now. Wow. And yeah, we, we met. I remember... Going to the going to the class, yeah, and then like you know being meeting all the people, being all nervous and a bit shy and stuff, and then this this guy this guy came in to the class and we just clicked straight away, you know, yeah. and um, and he was we probably were, shy as well. He was probably in the same. Yeah, emotion. yeah, we were, we were both I guess a little bit. We someone said the other day like you can have like a um a, a zap like a, a wand that's fully charged yeah it's charged and then another one that's fully charged it like you you kind of attract one another right. and i think that's what we did and so we just like hit it off straight away and we're running like we'd chase each other and, and just we just instantly clicked and we're still really close these days as well that's amazing yeah. amazing so that was those early years and he ended up leaving in like year three so that was year one in year three he left Hammersley, Glendale mm -hmm. Primary School. And then, um, and yeah, so yeah, that was my early days, early memories. Yeah, yeah. fun. And what were you doing uh, pastime? BMXing? What was it? What was popular back then? Skateboarding? What was it? Skateboarding, BMX. Uh, skate parks? Skate parks. I loved, I loved BMX actually. Like, um, got a, I raced it, raced BMX at Westside BMX track. I think wow. it was called back then. I don't know what it's called now. Um, so I, yeah, I love BMX. I love footy, playing footy. So were you quite adventurous, risky? Yeah, I was. Yeah. And yeah. the parents gave you the freedom to to go yeah. on, the, on the rinks and absolutely, yeah. Oh well, mum, that it was, but mum was always scared. You know, like yeah. she'd always, I've always been a little boy, still am. You yeah, know, and uh, so she. She kind of it was. It's weird. She always let me go, but she'd always like <gasps> fuss, you know. Yeah. But that's that's cool. I think that's uh, you know, it's it's cool. It, I knew I was loved, you know. Um, and footy, you were very natural, weren't you? Yeah, naturally, naturally gifted. Like I went, remember, I was kick playing going down when I was year five. My my dad took me and just I 
I played for a little bit and then I remember something kind of shifted in me when I was playing footy in Auskick and that we used to have these lines like yeah. the th- there was like a, there's two two lines to like cut it into thirds and you weren't able to move into the other thirds. Yeah. And I remember kicking a goal from like the if you kicked a goal from the center yeah. over the the third it wasn't a goal oh. because you had to yeah and but yeah I kicked a I kicked this like long kick long yeah. goal and I was like I remember that I was like oh I may have some sort of skill uh, skill gift. here yeah gift. A gift, yeah, as, as a kid, I, I, you know, however that sounds, it's like, but you remember as a kid? Yeah, when yeah, if, uh, well, especially when the goal goes in. Goes. Yeah, all the kids were like, whoa, you know, yeah. and I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm awesome. Real size footy. Yeah, no, no, it was smaller. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> wow, amazing. Yeah, so like. And life at home was pretty good? Yeah, yeah. it was, yeah. Um, so my, it was mostly my mum. And my older sister, mm-hmm. uh, growing in those early years, mum would have like, um, my older sister's dad, um, Alan, is the man like the, that brought me up. Um, oh, and your dad wasn't on the scene? No, no. Nah, he was in uh, like New Zealand. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, he, he was there, but just not in the, there, like, um, you know, available. So did you think Alan was your dad for a while when you were small? No. Nah. Or not biologically, like I always knew that he was Would you call him dad or Alan? I call him, I still call him dad, yeah. He's okay. He's the dad that's always been there, yeah. Okay, nice, mm. nice. And then um, in your teenage years, how how you went to high school? I did, yes. Of course. And I graduated, I graduated high school. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, my teenage, like I was a natural, bit an adventurous young boy, young mm-hmm. man. And played um, BMX, did BMX, skateboarding, um, all that sort of stuff. And so primary school, I went from Glendale Primary School to Newman Junior College. Oh, private. Yeah, pri- to a private school. My mum got married and we moved to Churchlands and then started going to Newman Junior in year mm-hmm. four. And it was, it was a bit different there, you know, because... More opportunities for sports. So. Yeah, and the kids were a bit different. Yeah, the, the schooling was a different. Like, it was... Because, uh, you know, as a kid, like, I liked where I was. Yeah. And then you can remember that... I can remember the shift into... Big. Yeah, like, you had to wear a uniform and yeah. and um, all the kids were a bit... Were less... They're a bit more tight, like, you know, uptight. Yeah. All, the, all the public school kids were a bit loose. I don't know. It's probably yeah, just, yeah. just thinking back. No, it is. It is a different uh, atmosphere. Yeah. Different culture, of course. So I was, uh, I guess I was a bit of a, I stirred the teachers up a bit Mm -hmm. in Newman Junior. Um, I had my first cigarette in Newman Junior College when I was like 11. Oh. Yeah, I took my mum's, my mum's menthol cigarette to to school and um, I took two and I tried to convince, I convinced one of my friends at the school to smoke it with me. Yeah. And, um. And in the toilets? No, it was on the field. There's a big field because you, you know the Newman Junior House yeah. got the you live just behind there, right? Eh? Yeah, I do. And it's so there's like a hill and there's a bit of bush. Bush, yeah. So we just smoke. Oh, I run there five o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I still do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do my sprints. <laughs> me on the moon. Yeah. There's no one, no one there at that hour. Just me and my it's dog. It's too early, yeah. yeah. Five, it's still dark. It's not even the cleaners have come in. Nah. <laughs> the lights aren't on. <laughs> you know. I only see the steam of the pool, you know, yeah. in winter. Okay, so you, you smoke your first cigarette there. It was young. Did, did you yeah. get busted or not? Nah. Oh, so the, the, other, the other boy that smoked the cigarette with me, his parents found out and then, and it, yeah, then my parents found out. The school oh. Found out. So it was, it it was, was trouble. Kind of, yeah. It was. I remember the friction that that caused with um the friend I had and our family because we were all quite close. Yeah, it caused that that friction. So he must have confessed. I must have. I can't remember how how it all worked out, but he he must have. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's 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 not a it's not a really thing that at that it, age you you just got to get it off your chest. Really. Yeah, because it and even then it, it, that was what the nineties. It smoking was not it was not good. Yeah. Yeah. So and especially at a at a at a private school, like what what else did you get into? What other trouble did you get into? Um, or a bit later. 
Hey. I'd be later. Then the next year, when in year seven, I um, had my first, um, they call it a bong. Okay. Um, marijuana. And um, I don't even know how, like, I wasn't this, I was a, I was a bit of a mischievous kid, but I wasn't. You like you would have seen me looked at me and gone oh he's he's right he's I knew how to charm people yeah. from an early age and um so yeah was, one of my friends older brothers like was talking about wheat marijuana one day and I was like I'll have some and he was actually at Newman Senior College and they they're kind of close. close yeah and we met half we organized to meet there was no mobile phones but we organized on a, on the weekend to meet on like a Monday or a Tuesday at lunchtime. And so I had my other twenty five dollars. I don't know how I got it. I probably stole, stole it or something. Off. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so we met at the um, the middle, and then he like gave me this like little baggie of weed, sachet, and sachet of weed. I took it, and then he he told me how to make the the bong. So you you know get the hose and then the the bottle and oh. everything, the water. And I just convinced another friend to have it with me. Um, so you and never did these alone? <laughs> nah, I'd always try to get someone to help you out. Help me out, yeah. Bring someone else into it. And um, how did you feel when you had that smoke, that bong? I, I've slipped out. Like it didn't. I think from an early age, um, I didn't. My my body has never like reacted. Never reacted well to marijuana. Mm-hmm. Like just the sight, the psyche, and the, it kind of mess like. Yeah, it messed with my, my brain. Yeah. So I actually freaked out. I, I had it. Um, and then I was on my little BMX and I had, I remember um, like just bailing from my friend at the school and because we were at um, Double View Primary School in uh, at like 4 p.m. or something and we were just in the, we just found a spot. And, yeah. Uh, and, um, and yeah, so I just sort of took off. Mm-hmm. And I remember riding around and, I remember um, thinking to myself, I'm going to tell my mum, I'm going to tell my parents, I need to call them, like, because yes. they were actually away. And while staying at my friend's house, I was like, I'm going to, I've got to tell them, I'm like freaking out here, riding my bike. I had the little hose, the little kind of thing, and I chucked it away. And I was <laughs> riding my bike around, and um, I was riding for about 30 minutes to an hour or something. And then I ended up meeting up with my friend. And, and yeah, then we just went back into, and then I just, it kind of started wearing off and I calmed down a bit. Yeah. Um, so, and then the next weekend, then I had some more, and it, but I, I never really liked it. Mm. I never really liked um, marijuana. It's um, just, I think my, my, how I'm made up, how God made me, it's just, it's like, no, don't, don't have that. But I, I kind of kicked up against that and I would keep trying to make it work. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was, it's really young. Like I look at twelve year olds now, and they just don't look like they should be smoking oh. cigarettes or. That's right. Yeah. Being on their own on the streets. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, yeah. So did it become a, a a usual thing on the weekends or? Yeah, it did. I, well, that first, so the first, I had that little bag, and yeah. then um, then it just ran out, and I didn't do it, and again until I was in year eight. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like you shift for. Back then, you shifted from high school. So you're in primary school in year seven and then you went to high school, school in year eight. Yep. Yeah. So uh, then in year eight and nine, that's when it became. So was it common at school at Newman? It was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was It was kind of, I can't remember, maybe not entirely at Newman, but there was a bunch of us like um, that got to know each other. Yeah. The kids. So it was a, a whole, uh, like an array of schools at that age Yeah, that we would, you know, you'd know your, your stoners and your, the guys that drank alcohol. And, um, did you start on alcohol as well? In year eight, I remember my first uh, drink was, I was 13 mm-hmm. and, um, oh, I'd, I'd had snuck beers in here and there before that, but the first time I got drunk, I just, yeah, I loved it. I fell in love with alcohol straight straight away. With alcohol or with the idea of getting drunk? Both. Both. I loved it. I loved everything about drinking the beers, um, the camaraderie that came with it, yeah. the, the anticipation, getting the getting the alcohol and escaping. Yeah. Um, you know, and 
I just remember having the, you know, this finishing the six pack and I was just nothing. It was like, it was just, I was at ease. Yeah. And every, all of my worries went away. It was just, it was amazing. And I thought that that's, I thought I'd found heaven. Yeah. yeah that, that was my God at that, that, that time in my yeah. life. Yeah. I didn't, I thought that that's what I, that was my fuel. That was like my, every, each weekend from, um, year eight like that i'll be always waiting to to drink some alcohol would you go to parties or just i'll go to parties yeah, yeah. Um, and your parents did they pick up on this did they realize that or you kept it hidden? kept it a secret yeah. yeah yeah um we used to go to um we used to go to tell our parents all the ever all this the kids the, yeah um used to tell our parents that we're going to the movies in yeah. the loop yeah but then we'll go down to jack out lake and, and who would buy the alcohol for you? There was always somebody older. Um, so some some guys looked older, even yeah. at thirteen. They there was a guy there was a guy there that could get served. Okay. At thirteen. Yeah. Um. And uh, but then like, cause you just go up to adults, like when they're going into the bottle shop, and yeah. just say, "Oh, can you get us a, a carton?" Or it, older older um. Guys would pay. Would all, they, yeah. yeah the all the brothers food. and sisters of all of us too, yeah. you would have to like um, beg them to get some booze for us. Like, So an older brother or sister would get some once a month or yeah. you'd have to play them all at, yeah. at different times. So, And yeah. then you just get off your face every weekend. At Jack Hatter Lake, yeah. There was one time mum picked me up um, from Jack Hatter Lake when I was like, in year nine, I must have been fourteen or something, and I was really drunk and stoned. Like I couldn't, I couldn't. I was like, you, my vision was completely blurred. I couldn't hold a conversation. I was slurring my words, and and straight away, mum was like, "What's wrong with you?" And yeah. and I got back, um, got into my, got back home, and there was vomit all over. I vomited all over the wall in the shower. Oh. Yeah, everywhere, and um, I was in deep trouble after that, and um. So yeah, that's when it it was like year nine or ten. Um, yeah. So, but somehow it's it, you just kept kept doing it, mm. um, find new ways and different. And um, I remember when I was like maybe thirteen or fourteen and and drinking, I I was I remember having this like kind of moment of clarity. I was like, doing this every weekend is not a good idea. <laughs> No, <laughs> it's like, but it was. I knew I was, in my heart. I was like, nah, I get, I'm gonna have to stop. But I couldn't. I couldn't stop. Yeah. So it, you had gone I was already in. Yeah. And did you do you think it was an addiction already? Looking back, I think yeah, it was. Yeah, mm. it was controlling. It was gripping straight away. I think my my makeup, like a lot of my mates from back then, are, are doing great. Was now. it enough, or you were looking for more adventurous stuff? I think the adventure came out in the looking to escape instead of instead of um, doing it in other ways like like the skateboarding style. The, I kept on playing Aussie Rules footy, um, but yeah, my adventure and my um, you know es- escapism was all in alcohol and um, drugs and stuff. So, what about girls? Not yet. And girls, yeah, no, already, yeah, I um. So I had my first kiss when I was twelve or thirteen in primary school, and then I'd ha- I like had a girlfriend in year eight and nine. Like I'd have always have a girlfriend. Yeah, um, I was like, I guess she became sexually active quite early. Um, sexually active. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, maybe fourteen, fourteen or fifteen. Mm. Yeah, it was. And it was like ever that was, you know, as a kid, you'd say, oh, have you had, you know, have you had sex or have you like this or that? And so it was just the whole, even though, you know, the school is a Catholic school. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just the whole, I think, yeah, it was just normal. I literally did not think anything of it. I thought yeah. the sooner that I would have um, sex with a, like a girl is the sooner I'm a man. Okay. So that was what I, I just. Passage into manhood. Yeah. yeah. That's just what I thought. And um, I don't think that that was, I don't know how that happened. It just did. Yeah. So, you don't even remember? I don't. Oh, no. I, yeah, I remember the first <laughs> time. Yeah. But, um, but, yeah, I just 
you know, I didn't yeah. think anything of it. Yeah. Well, maybe at that time you had no, you didn't have the awareness of what mm. it meant. Yeah. No, I didn't know no awareness at all. Yeah. No, I just wasn't. It was just a not like I just wanted to tick it off, you know, to do it. So was it an opportunity for you to carry on with sport? Was uh, were you that good to to make it in a team? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, I was playing for Maris Blue and Black, which were good teams at the time. You know, would win premierships. Um, you know, a lot of the players from that team went to, on to play f- like for. There was a couple that played the AFL and a couple, wow. couple for the like West Australian Football League. Yeah, well, um, and I had I had the potential. Absolutely, yeah. like I'll win personal accolades in teams and yeah. best and fairest and and all that sort of stuff. When I was about thirteen or fourteen, like I, I could, but then the natural ability was there. But you had to couple that with hard work. Mm-hmm. So all of the kids and I was a bigger. I was about this this size when I was thirteen or fourteen. Okay, yeah. So I had I grew quick. Yeah. I, I reckon that I had some more growing to do. Yeah, but the and drugs I just missed yeah. out. Yeah, missed out on the growth. Who knows? That's looking back. Um, but yeah, I stopped. Obviously, the the natural talent was there, but the the work it was like the talent was there, but the work was like yeah. here. And then so the kids that the talent was there the same, then their work was there. They just <laughs> when it was through. oh, uh, like you could like I stopped playing good footy. At about 17, mm-hmm. 17, or probably 16, it started to really be noticeable. Yeah. I mean, 16 or 17, when all the other kids had started to grow and and um, then I was starting to drink like like it was starting to set in. Mm-hmm. And um, so I'm, I guess I, I stopped. I kept on playing. So I played for Claremont, um, Claremont Colts. Um, I was... Started playing earlier than normal for Claremont Colts and then played for three. I played for like one year before I was meant to and then one year after. So I was there for like four years. Wow. And by the the last year I was in there, I'd been overtaken. So it's like I just grew stale in it. Um, Academically, how how were you performing? So year 11, I was doing um, like TE subjects or ATAR, I think it is now. And I was, yeah, I passed, passed everything. Yeah. And then year 12, I just stopped. I what, just, what made that? Um, I think it was lack of, looking back, I think it was lack of discipline and it was lack of um, motivation. It was lack of, uh, it was lack of um, conviction. Conviction, yeah. I didn't have anything. I didn't have, I was like blowing so around. No drive. Anything. No drive. It's just nothing. I didn't have what any horsepower. Um, alcohol and uh, footy. Okay. Yeah. So how? When were the heavier drugs introduced? Uh, heavier drugs. So I started taking um, like Dexy Dexamphetamine, which is a uh, for AD, people kids with ADD or people with ADD. Mm-hmm. Um, got my hands on some of those tablets, and um, that was that would help me drink more, and because. I guess my favorite feeling is feeling good and feeling um, having lots of energy and being able to do lots of stuff without too much struggle internally. Yeah. And yeah. so those the Dexies would do that for me. They'll give me that extra. They'll give me that extra gear that I didn't have. Yeah. On not on drugs, and uh, so fifteen or sixteen, you know, I started taking Dexies and alcohol at the same time. And then um, I had my first MDMA tablet when I was 18 and I loved it. it What's was, an MDMA for those people ex- like myself who have no idea? <laughs> um, ecstasy. Okay. So they call it ecstasy, yeah. So, um, so it's a chemical. So it makes you feel warm. It's, it's makes, you know, it's, yeah. It makes, it's like, you know, it's like having Christ as your person personal lord and savior that's, that's how it it's an artificial kind of okay. yeah in hindsight <laughs> in hindsight that's what i was looking for yeah yeah I was so it was it was a desperate call yeah for, yeah for help really yeah looking back it, it was yeah I'm, but i remember the first time i had ecstasy i um i loved it so much that i went up and down all the hallways i was knocking on all these people's doors and just like saying hello 
And yeah. <laughs> well, just the most loving shell. person. Yeah. 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 And I just came out of my shell on it. Um, all of my worries, all of my fears, all of my anxieties just washed away. And that was when I was 18. Um, then I started taking cocaine. Uh, cocaine um, and pills. I, I loved I loved MDMA pills. Yeah, they really just that love warmth feeling. Um, was it mainly on the weekends or during the week as well? It would always start on the weekends and then it would kind of spill over onto the weekends. Did you begin work or you went to tape? What did you do when you finished year 12? So year 12 finished. Then I was playing footy. Yeah, um, f- yeah I was playing footy uh, for Claremont. And um, then I was working like a part-time job. Mm-hmm. So it was that my plan was like a little break here. Yeah. Like to have a kind of a break. And um, so that year I was... Still living at home or you moved out? Yeah, I was still living at home, yeah. Um, Didn't your parents pick up on the fact that you were uh, on drugs? No. Now, well, so my mum was going through a hard time. My, so there was a divorce um, with mm-hmm. my mum and her um, marriage. So I slipped through the cracks. Like my yeah. mum got breast cancer. Oh. And she um, had some serious... Uh, health issues um, yeah. emotionally she uh, you know she had some emotional stuff and physical stuff going on um, and so I I escaped that by drinking and drugging mm-hmm. looking back yeah so I that I was traumatized by that my mum you know because yeah. mum's always been my rock and for her uh, not being okay like I sort of freaked out and this was 13 or 14 then that's when I started drinking and drugging and so um it was like I think it was just I could get through the cracks yeah you know I knew how to play I knew how to like um give one facade to my mom to my to my dad um and to I knew how to play them yeah from a from an early age um and you know uh, mistakes would come up like I would have get too drunk one time and then but then I'd um see my dad owned a pub um oh. so I would so that you know it was alcohol and not that it's their their, their issue but it was a part of it I had drinking alcohol and socializing it was it's the thing that it's yeah it was common yeah every weekend kind of thing so um so it was inbuilt into me from an early age from these beliefs that I caught, picked up, was that I you drink alcohol to socialise, to, to be a man, to be, yeah. you know, yeah. And this just got you deeper and deeper into it. Yeah, just no... Um, so the career didn't go well, the footy career. So I broke my thumb mm-hmm. and um, in a punch-up at a nightclub. And so I went back to training um, and they were like, what happened? You know, it was the off season. They were like, what happened? You know, um, yeah. because it, the, it was playing Colts at that stage. So it was actually, it was, if you had an injury, you should tell, especially if it's at a, at a nightclub, you know, you tell them straight yeah. away. Um, and I didn't, and it was like a month. So, and they were okay with that. They were there to support me, but I was like, the writing was on the wall for me. It was all yeah. too hard. You know, yeah. you, I couldn't hang on any longer. Mm. And um, I just, so I gave up Claremont and then played amateurs for Scarborough for a year. Yeah. I became a bartender mm-hmm. and just gave away my footy, my footy career. Mm. Um, which looking back, like um, I probably, looking back, I, I, I regret. I regret not having, not um, fulfilling that potential that was there. Um, but that's the consequences you deal with when you when you um you know don't focus on anything but yeah yeah so um so I became a bartender and then I was you know was a bartender till about 20 2021 and then I did a tape course my dad came and said get some clothes yeah you got to do something so I picked um I picked uh, just this all these silly courses like that, but he was like, "No, you need to you need something that's gonna you're gonna earn an income, yeah, and it's that's sustainable." So I heard about mining, yeah. so I did a 
I originally um, picked a drilling course, and mm-hmm. then one of my friends said, "Matt, he was a driller." He said, "Man, nah, you don't want to. It's heavy. You don't want to do that." And so I was like, "Okay, um, I'll just do the other one." I couldn't even pronounce what the course was. It was like <laughs> metallurgical resource processing or something, and so I was just like, "I'll do that." I don't, you know, that sounds all right. And um, it was a cert two, and um, we're pretty good at school. You picked up things quite well, didn't you? If, if I like put my mind to something, all my energy into it, which I have the ability to do, like I can, I can, if, if it's not, I can, ex, not so I can do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's most things, um, you know, maybe not be the best, but I can usually wrap my head around stuff yeah. if I just cancel out all the distractions that can, yeah. that can go on. Yeah. Um, so I did that and then got a job in uh, mining. From that and so oh, flying fire fly, FIFO yeah which exposed you to even more evil more money yeah more money now you could do whatever you wanted when you came back yeah that meant more alcohol more drugs more mm. women more fun more everything yeah so pretty much when you were back in town you were knocked out yeah yeah and so like this is where this is where my my isolation from the world and and my warped sense of reality really took a hold was um you know i look at photos like looking back at that time in my life and i look fine like i literally but you don't remember much i remember it all oh you remember it all yeah yeah but i look fine in the photos yeah in the photos like um my mum showed me a photo of when i was like 21 eight years ago and um i looked like my my hair was i had hair but my hair was a bit messy and stuff but I just remember looking like I remember the fear, like the feeling, my internal uh, struggle yes. was was real. But on the outside, I looked fine. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's where it really kicked off. So I'd be at work for eight days. I was eight days on, six days off at that that time. And then then I started using meth um, on my first. Like a few friends were taking meth around that time. So um, I was an inquisitive young man so one one time i walked into i was at a party and i walked into this bathroom and um there was a meth pipe going around and i so sort of just had some and um was hooked instantly mm. and that was my first that was a week before i flew out and then when i got home from my first swing i got paid about a thousand i don't know a thousand in in my bank account a thousand yeah. bucks then one of the the guys that i knew had the 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 math like I just bought some and then that was me like that was the whole week basically oh maybe a a day or two at that stage Um, because you had to clear up Uh, did they did did they do a test when you went back to the mines yeah yeah Yeah. not it was random but you would kind of gauge it so for about six months from then I was I'll each week back I'll I'll um go on these benders with with friends and uh you know it was it was a heap of fun yeah. like it was a lot of fun it was like we'd play music and a lot of us played guitar and and they were good times but but same with like the marijuana and the alcohol yeah for me and meth like it did that doesn't click it's it's i'm chase always chasing this this thing with it like this piece um yeah. which i can never find and yeah the meth um is a powerful, powerful drug, and when I when I when I take it, I like I lose. It's not like the concept. Yeah, I I turn into a different person. Like it's really dark. You yeah. Know? And the, after the first time I had meth, like and really got high off it, I was never the same. I've never been the same since. It mm. it can it it took something from me. Yeah. So meth is worse than uh, than heroin. Would you say? No, I've never had heroin, but um. It's meth is the worst drug I've tried. Yeah. It, it the first time I had it, it took it took some innocence from it. Took, it just yeah. like it's like boom. I've never got it back. Like morality, you know, like it's being restored. Goodness, yeah, innocence, um, like a sense of cleanness. Like um, that was. I just remember that was gone. That from that first time. So from there on was it, it was even a more downward spiral. Yeah, yeah. It's quite sad, really, looking back and. Um, but I, I kind of didn't go come crashing down straight away. Like I met a girl mm-hmm. on the mines and um, sort of had this kind of semi-normal sort of relationship, and then that didn't work, and so I went f- fell back into um, 
into drugs. Um, but I was kind of trying to ma- manage it. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just like, it was, it was, um, it was a really large part of my life was, um, drugs and alcohol. Like it was probably the main, um, it was the staple from the age of 13 till, till when I, you know, stopped what it was, it was everything to me. Um, yeah. I wouldn't have admitted that at the time, but yeah, drugs and alcohol, um, was what, what I centered all of my, you know, identity from. Was there any desire to escape it, to, to get away from it or not really? Did you realize that this was damaging you or not? Um, a sense of denial. No, it's, it's, I didn't think that there was any solutions and I wasn't actually looking for, I was looking at for solutions in probably the wrong places. Like, so earning an income, um, you know, meeting, meeting a woman and, uh, or like having money in my account going traveling. So I would, I would start to go traveling. Uh, you know, I ended up getting a job, um, you know, working away on a two and two week on one week off roster. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was on like 150 grand a year. Wow, crazy. And it was just a shock. It was a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, but during that time, I kind of cleaned up a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then I started to go traveling. I was like, I want to, I want to um, do something with my, with yeah. my life, you know? Yeah. So I went traveling overseas um, to Europe and, and stuff like that. And, and I was, and then I started going to Bali and, and the Philippines and, all this sort of stuff that mine workers kind of do. Yeah. And, but it didn't, it didn't fulfill me. No. It was a bunch of fun. Like I, I remember going to Ibiza for a week and um, just getting cocaine o- over the bar and, and being, I was there by myself. Like I always kind of wanted to go by myself yeah. to places. Like I just always wanted to get away from people. And uh, so I was there by myself and in Ibiza, copious amounts of, Cocaine and alcohol. Where's this Ibiza? In Spain, I think. Okay. Spain, in the, on an island, yeah, just yeah. on the east coast. Oh, Ibiza. Yeah, Ibiza, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ibiza. Ibiza, yeah. yeah. And um, I had a night there where I was in, I so I was up for five days or something and then had a night where I drank too much and I had a complete blackout. Mm. And I woke up the next morning and I was in my hotel room. And you I, missed your flight? No, no, no. That would have been a good story, but... Um, yeah, I just woke up and I was like, oh, I had this like killing headache. I was like, oh, and then it's like the, then the dread kicked in. It was like, oh, what, how did I get here? I can't remember anything. Like, and, um, I felt really unsafe in that yeah. moment. I was by myself that, that dread like that. It, panic attack. It, yeah, it was a panic, but it was, it was worse than that. It wasn't a panic. I never really panicked, but it was like a, a hole in mm. my stomach. It's like, oh, I'm so alone, you know? And what I'm like, I'm oh, and then I remember walking back to this club, like where I was with like no shoes, and and some of the people, like you know, I beat that they have all these people trying to sell you stuff all the time, and I think you know they were all like, hey, and I couldn't remember, so I must have, you know, can't remember what I what happened. That set that feeling, and then there was groups of like English men and women all together, and everyone having a good time, and, and just that empty feeling. Um, when, when the drugs and the alcohol like wore off and I was by myself, it was like, ugh, like this isn't what I want to do. And um, so anyway, I lost my phone and my shoes and everything and I had to make it to to um, Paris. And yeah, it's, um, yeah, I was just doing all that, that behavior that you don't want to be doing. But irresponsible. Just, irresponsible, yeah. Yeah. Mm. But I, I thought I was being responsible by doing by going traveling yeah. I was like oh this is, I'm, I'm I'm doing something you know mm. so did um, you get into any crimes or like stealing or no nah, not really no nah, because when I was working in the mines so I could oh, you had money had money at, yeah. by, at by that stage yeah um, when did the um, idea of you know um, rehab come into your mind? Um, well, it never really came into my mind. It was so, um, always implied that somebody else. Yeah. So your parents already knew that you were yeah. an addict. 
Mm. So it came out um, over a series of situations like somehow, so my parents found out yeah. that I was using meth and, and it was, they, there was a bit of an intervention and I couldn't pay my money at my, um, the house I was living at. And so that was going to be the change. Yeah. And, but it didn't, they found out and then it kind of got worse. I, like I tried to fix myself by, um, moving away and then I came back and then I tried to get on the mines again and I actually did get back onto the mines mm-hmm. and for about a year mm-hmm. in 2016, 2017. Yeah. Um, so I'd had a massive rock bottom, lost everything and then tried to fix it. My parents found out, family found out that it came out of, the cat was out of the bag that I was yep. using meth. Um, so my idea was I got back on the mines in 2016, start of 2016, or maybe end of any end of 2015, start of 2016, got back on the mines, started earning money again, moved out, got started, got a car, got my own things, and um, and uh, yes, yeah, so that was my idea of healing. Yeah, but the problem was still there. Mm. I hadn't. There was no healing done whatsoever. Like I yeah. was just trying to run away from it, um, run away from myself. Like there's a saying that. Wherever you go, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the case for me. And um, so so this so I moved out into this house um, and then had some money in my, my account again. And then I started buying larger amounts of meth. Like I stopped for about three months, larger amounts of meth, and yeah. then the, the behavior became more erratic. It started, to, you know, started to become harder to get to work. And because the roster I was working was like 12 days on. 10 days off. So if I used, used for eight days yeah. um, and then two, two days to clear, two days clear up and then I'll get back to work. I'll still be high. Like yeah. semi, I didn't even care about the drug test by then. And it would get to day two or three or four of the swing. And I just had to come back and cause I was coming down. I needed yeah. more drugs. And so there was one time I had a month, I had a swing off of work, which was 12 or 14 days. And so it was a month, I had yeah. a whole month. And I just completely went for it on the drugs and spent all my money. And I still had some possessions at that point. Um, so that all came to a head at the in 2017, June 2017. And um, I couldn't, I quit my job and just be, like my idea, my literal plan was just to become a full-time drug addict. <laughs> like I met if some, there is such a thing. Yeah, well, there is. <laughs> How would you pay for it? Um, so I had a... Oh, I had some money saved yeah. up and then I bought uh, this this car, this this nice big Land Cruiser. Then all the money dried up. Then I sold the Land Cruiser and then, you know, spent all the money in about two weeks. And then I kind of, I don't, then I just started stealing off my family. Yeah. Um, and I was hanging around with some guys who, who were seasoned dealers and um, I was no good at that, but. Mm. I was I I didn't um I didn't want to do crime yeah um but I kind of started to just try to drive people around and I was just try to wanted to like hang I didn't want to be responsible for, I just wanted to take the drugs I didn't yeah. want to have to do any work to get the drugs yeah um so I'll take it out I'll just my mum's furniture just started walking out the house and I'll <laughs> just sell it and yeah I was I'll sell my pop left some stuff for my mum. He'd, he'd, um, and you know, I was starting to sell that and I was stealing, you know, bank cards out of family members. I was borrowing off friends. Um, you know, I was trying, I was trying to, you know, they, they say get tick of yeah. drug dealers, but none of them, they're like, you know, you know they like, know you. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've seen it before. Yeah. Yeah. But I was, you know, I was, I was fun to have around for a bit of time. But then after a while, if you're not, if in that scene, if you're not, making your own keep if you're not turning over the drugs if you're not stealing if you're not bringing something or selling drugs or selling if you're not bringing something then you can't what are you doing here yeah Yeah, like go away um so i was kind of just trying to fit in and you know i'd start to i started to semi kind of try to do something but it never eventuated so there was a dead end for me so i there was no money no nothing everyone hated me I hated myself and so my family kind of was organizing. It's a lot of, it's a long story, but my, so my family were organizing a rehab. So I was like, you know what? Okay, I'll go. 
Yeah. Um, I was, I was exhausted by that. It had been about two or three years when I was just a, no, it was about eight years of just, it was about 10 years of just going backwards. <laughs> and um, I was just had enough by that point. And um, I took the offer. Then I went to a rehab in Queensland at the end of 2017. Yeah. And stayed there for eight months. Wow. I got clean mm-hmm. for eight months. And um, then I relapsed again over in Queensland. Mm. And so I built this life up. And uh, huge disappointment. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was a massive disappointment. Um, there's so much work that goes into it. Yeah. Um, spiritual work. Like I was introduced to um, like a, a program that it's a spiritual program um like that that rehab kind of wanted you like encouraged to find a, a higher power yeah and so i started praying and um journaling and doing these a few spiritual disciplines um and i really loved it yeah i loved it yeah i loved kind of this sense of being connected to something greater than me yeah um at first it was hard to to kind of con- con- i couldn't it's like a power greater than me i, I couldn't grasp it. it was like the universe you know yeah um but that's not the universe isn't a reliable source. Like yeah. it's gonna I don't know. That's that's I came to that, you know, a few years later. But but I loved praying and I loved um I didn't know what I was praying to, but you know, they they see in that rehab they said you get down and get down on your knees in the morning yeah. um, when you get up and just ask for a clean day. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the day, just say thank you yeah. for a clean day to whatever. Yeah. And um say a God of your own understanding. So I just did that. And uh, that kept me clean. I stayed in that that rehab program for uh, eight months. And then I, some emotional stuff came up and I just, the only solution I knew was to to use drugs. Yeah. So I found someone over there that, um, yeah, so so then I relapsed and, oh, it was, I did, because I I didn't want to relapse, you know. Mm, Of course not. Yeah. Oh, you've come such a long way. mm. And then you came back to Perth or what did you do? Yeah, so I came back to Perth in September 2018. Did your family know that you relapsed or not? Yeah, you yeah. Because I'd built, even though they were in Perth, I'd built some rapport up again with them yeah. and tried to put, bring them along on the journey yeah. with me, which was encouraged. Um, so, I, you know, after I'd relapsed, I'd, you know, I was, t- I was open with my with my mum. I, I was always, I began to be open with my mum yeah. at that point at that point um so yeah then i came back they knew i was like one day clean when i came back um but i was probably worse off emotionally um from when i left yeah because i'd done it again Mm. you know even with all that support even with all of that stuff i was like oh i've used again and i didn't even want to do this yeah done all this healing and um so i was in perth for about three months just you know, I I got I got back to Perth and I stayed clean for like 50, 50 days or something. And wow. Picked up again. Wow. And then um, found another rehab in Perth, and then went back into re. So there was three three months out of a rehab facility. Yeah. Went back in in December twenty eighteen. Stayed mm-hmm. twelve or thirteen weeks, and then it got too much emotionally again. Then I relapsed. I left and relapsed. Mm-hmm. And um, by this stage, it was just like. Groundhog Day. Yeah. Just too too much, too hard. Yeah. And it's, I don't know, like, um, the sense where you're trying to get something, you're trying to do something, it's like a, you know, it, and you can't. It's a moving target. Yeah. And everyone, because you'd start to see people um, get clean and, and change, and then you're, you can't. Yeah. And it's like, it, it really breaks you. Like, that was actually more of a rock because I could feel it now. I could mm. see that I could see that change was possible. I could see that I was actually living a, a lie yeah. using once. And yeah. I could see that change was possible. Yeah. From um because you had those months where mm. you could uh be awesome. Yeah. And then you went again. Went again. Yeah. And I you know I got in touch with some friends um from the past and they're all nice people, you know. Um I've 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 seen a few people get clean. Yeah. from that time you know and I, you know if if they were to get clean you um, could I, like those people still using if they were to get clean like i'll be here with open arms but you know so anyway i got um got in touch with them 
again yeah. when I was back in Perth and it's just they were worse um you know so the, I was got work like it, it, they say addiction is progressive and even when you're um like if you've had addiction issues and you stop the addiction still progresses. It mm -hmm. lays dormant. Yeah, yeah. Um, same with smoking. You know, how people, a yeah, smoker always picks up, can pick up smoking really easy and they go back to right. To, it's the same with what I understand. It's the same with all addiction, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, after picking up again, um, it was bad, you know. It's, you know, I wanted to, I was, I was willing to do crime by mm -hmm. this stage. I didn't care anymore. Yeah. Um, it's also a sense of anger. Yeah. With yourself, with yep. with the fact that you couldn't overcome this. Mm. Yeah, a lot of my anger was internal. Like I wouldn't act out, I wouldn't get in fights. You know, I, when I got in that, broke my thumb. Like I, I would never fight. Yeah. Um. So, but my anger, like I, I, I'd yell at, I yelled, I, I could yell. Like that was probably my, um, you know, scare factor. Like. Yeah. And uh. Yeah, but I would never, but my anger was in, I turned in on myself. Yeah. Yeah, I imploded. So there was a lot of anger there, yeah. Yeah. And then you went back into rehab. Went back into rehab, yeah. May 2nd, 2019. Yeah. And I haven't used since. Wow. Yeah, haven't touched, haven't touched a drink, haven't touched a drug um, since, yeah, 2nd of May, 2019. Praise God. Praise God, yeah. That's amazing. It is. Over two years. Um. How were you introduced to our church? You came, uh, was it Steve that brought you here? Steve, yeah. Steve met, Zappa. Zappa. Steve Ross. He, he met you at um, one of those AA meetings. Yeah. And uh, so he he just said, come to church with me. Um, yeah, so Steve, yeah, just said, come to church, come to church with me um, in, uh, so when was it? Um, May 2020. So if we go back a little bit, um, when I was, so I kind of got introduced to, so the search for a higher power went on Yes. in this, so I was in this rehab I went to in um, May 2nd, like I knew I needed to get clean. So, yeah. and they encouraged to find a higher power at that rehab as well. Um, and when I was eight months there. I was starting to like get a life back and, and I met this, this man that I met over in Queensland and um, he had God, he had Jesus. And, yeah. um, and I started asking him questions. I was like, so what's this? He seemed different, you know, yeah. he didn't care about what people thought and all this sort of stuff. So I was like, what's, you know, what's this God thing all about? And then he, he said, um, we, we, it was like we were relational. He wasn't just like hammering me with a Bible. Yeah. Do, do, do. It was like I could see it in him. Um, and that attracted me, mm -hmm. um, mostly because he didn't care what other people thought. He seemed secure in his yeah. identity. He knew what his identity was. Yeah. And I could see that. I didn't know that that's what that was. Um, yeah. I could see it. So I said it, the, the sinner's prayer and uh, with doubt, you know, it wasn't, of I wasn't, it wasn't my whole heart. And um, then, but the next day, like I had this little, the love of God touched my heart the next wow. time. Wow. Yeah. So it triggered something. It triggered something. Yeah. So it was the beginning or something. That was, I'm sure the beginning was way back, you know, <laughs> way back, even when I didn't know yeah. it. Um, yeah. But that was when I kind of realized, it was like, oh, you know, maybe Jesus is real. Mm. And so I got given a Bible the next week, or a Bible was placed in my, I don't know, it just landed on my lap. Yeah. somehow and I started reading that for the last four months I was in that rehab every day mm -hmm. so from eight months in there to 12 months and then I found out Steve was a Christian and he started kind of he actually sent me the sinner's prayer via okay. email and I was at TAFE and um, do online study because COVID had kicked in yes and every time before I started TAFE I'd say the sinner's prayer mm. and I'd say it over and over and over and over again and um and I think that was, I was, I guess I was building my faith in that time. Um, and it was a personal, it, no one was telling me to do it. No one was, I was doing it in my own way. Yeah. And um, in that time, um, God said to me, I didn't know it was God, but I'm 100% it's God now. He said, you got to get baptized. 
Like if you, if you, if you want to show this, if you want to show how serious you are, well, you got to get baptized. Yeah. And um, so yeah, when I left in um, end of April, that rehab, um, Steve brought me here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, then I met you mm-hmm. and uh, I haven't left. Yeah. You're still I'm still here. here. Oh, praise God. <laughs> yeah. We started jogging at uh, Rio Bull Park. Yeah. Yeah. Once, twice a week, three times a week at times. Mm. Early mornings. It was about this time last year. Yeah, we were running. Yeah. And, um, you know, that that really, you were like, um, you know, the the exactly the right per It's like God, I believe God brought us together. Mm-hmm. And um, I, there was a, when I first walked into the church, I saw you and I was like, you know, I think I'm. I think I'm going to see this man again, like a lot. But I didn't know. You know, it's just yeah. a thought. But um, and then yeah, you introduced, like you were like invited me to go running, and I was kind of like yeah, a bit weird going running with a pastor. Yeah, at the church. And um, but anyway, we went running, and like we started forming that like a a, a relationship, a bond, and that meant a, a lot to me at the time. Yeah. Um. Uh, it really um anchored me. I needed a, a strong male that was um not that was solid like like you know yeah and um so yeah that that time was priceless you know mm-hmm. that, it was really integral i think god you know um for that time god like yeah we just came together and yeah those runs and um a bit of uh, royale's chicken yeah. as well and um yeah giving giving um those prayers at raybold hill over the top of the the top of the hill just those um, you know, you'd ask me to pray, you know, it was, it was real, you yeah. know, it wasn't like, um, that I don't, there was no, like, I don't think you were trying to get your numbers up for salvations or anything like, you know, you'd done it. You, it was, for me, it felt like it was authentic. It was like, so I was like, okay, cool. You um, weren't a project. You're a person. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I could, I didn't, I could feel that. And mm. I guess as a, as a, that, person coming in from the world who you hear all about the church and it's like you know all this bad stuff which um you know which people like you can just latch on to yeah and go, so that everything's bad you know um so i had those eyes on me i yeah. was like trying to you know pick apart and 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 um and i guess that melted away over over those times you were quite street smart as well. You could read people. So mm. basically, uh, you know, I couldn't have faked it. No. Because you would have seen it. Right? Yeah. I think so, yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, thank you for those times. It really no, meant a lot. Was, look, it was just a pleasure. I mean, I, I didn't know where where this was heading. You know, mm. I I was just obedient. And uh, the fact that you wanted to do it, you know, you, you know, when the Lord says... If you find a person of peace, stay with that person, stay in that house. So I took that principle, mm. you know, and I thought, you know, if the guy's ready. Do you remember when we prayed on top of the hill? Mm. Again, you gave your life to the Lord. But yeah. I think that day was quite significant, was, wasn't it? Mm, massive, yeah. Because, um, yeah, I remember like saying to you, I, I, I believe that I sounded like I was ready. I was mm. trying to, I was trying to, I, I couldn't have ever said, I couldn't have been direct and said, hey, Nathaniel, I want to give my after a lot I couldn't say that I was trying to like yeah. you know give all these hints out yeah and um so that day yeah we um and it was in public which it's you know it was good it wasn't in a church for me that's yeah. what I needed um I needed it to be it was in the car park yeah it was in a car park you know there was people around and we just said um the sinner's prayer you know repenting um yeah and for me honestly I repenting was no big deal yeah, like I was ready. I <laughs> yeah. was. I. I didn't. I needed. I need. Like I was just like. It was like I repent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't. No issue. Yeah. You knew you were a sinner. You knew you needed God, and that was it. Yeah. And it was like, um, yeah, here I am. I, I remember running down Heartbreak Hill mm. with you, and you were saying, "Yeah, I'm telling you, I feel it." <laughs> Do you yeah. remember? Yeah, yeah. You were saying this is this is better than drugs. Yeah, yeah. and you said there's. It was a a, a real point in that time when we were running down the hill and he said it's real you know yeah and uh because i was kind of like whoa like what's going on here he said it's real and then it was like it clicked 
Mm-hmm. It's like, it is. Yeah, it is. It's like, this is awesome. Like, wow. You know, um, and that was only, that was only a little glimpse of what that's happened over and over again in that short time, in this short time. It happens, you know, once a week now. And remember you said to me, I don't, I don't want to go home. Well, yeah. You know, stay with me kind of thing, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, we had lunch that day. I actually changed my schedule and we went to Royale's and had a burger. Yeah. And uh, it was good. Yeah. It was integral like that because, you know, giving, I felt like giving my heart to Jesus. Yeah. I felt a sense of vulnerability. Hmm. Um because I knew I something big had happened, but because it's like it's like changing, change. It's like it's being born again. Like, yeah, it's, it's massive. It's <laughs> gonna start everything over again, yeah. which I had already been doing. Technically, um, I was in. I was perfect time. Like God works in perfect time, and but I, was, I remember feeling really vulnerable, and um, I kind of needed uh, a um, a guide and a like spiritual father. Yeah, and um, that's what you had. That's what. You, provided and that's what you continue to provide for me is that that spiritual father who who um is solid yeah and 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 who i can trust and and that was really integral for me mm-hmm. um and that's why it's it's been such a um a, like a real blessing to um just journey journey with you yeah yeah well it was a, it's a privilege of course and then uh, we we baptized you in the ocean. Yeah. A few weeks later, probably less than two months, I think later. Yeah. So that was what end of May, and then baptized first of August, first of twenty twenty. Yeah. 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 In the Indian Ocean, I think it's Indian Ocean. Yeah. It's at Hillary's Sport Hub. Hillary's. Yeah. And yeah. Um, my whole family was there. Cold winter day. Yeah, it was freezing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Didn't stop us. Nah, a lot of people saw it uh, yeah. on the bridge, and it was a powerful public testimony. Mm. And uh, it was quite a significant moment as well. Not just in the fact that the obedience was there, but mm. you also felt the presence of God come upon you very mm. strongly when we prayed in the water, didn't you? Mm. Yeah, when um, yeah, it was you were praying in tongues up because it went back and then came up, and then it was kind of like stiff because yeah. my whole family was there, and I was worried like, oh, you know. They're gonna believe, think that I'm a, I'm a, I believe in, I'm crazy now. And, <laughs> um, so I was like, I didn't want to start like being like, woo, you know. I thought everyone was, you know, gonna, you know, imagining things. But anyway, you said just start saying, I guess you know the Holy Spirit through you was just said to me like, just start saying, just start praising God. You know, you were saying praying in tongues. Yeah. I just started saying, thank you Jesus, thank you Jesus, thank you Jesus, thank you Jesus, and then as and then when I watch this back, like you can see on the video, the sun actually starts to shine. Yeah. And um, and then in that moment, just like, just as you you were praying in tongues, and I was saying thank you Jesus, and then it's like my heart just went, it turned back on. Wow. It turned back on. Yeah. I'll never forget it. Never it's amazing. Forget. Yeah. It was. Um, I didn't start praying in tongues then, but it was it was there was a an opening in my heart. It wasn't a, it wasn't this rocky like hard, hard well a few weeks later you did start praying in tongues i did or first meeting when we introduced you to the uh, holy spirit baptism basically yeah. you just surrendered mm. and that, that was again another a new level um from head to heart yeah i could start to it's like just allowing it's allowing god to work through it's like letting go yeah it's scary i heard this um it's like it's like holding on to a stick, you know. Yeah. Um, and then it's you're on the side of a cliff. You're holding on to this branch, and then you can, it's you can't see how far it is down. Yeah. It's like a cloud, and then it's like you let go, and then it's just like one meter, <laughs> just there. And it's that's like I love that. I love it when I that analogy. Read that. Yeah. That's what it's like. Yeah. How did you? I mean. It, it must have felt weird first to to just let go of your tongue and mm. your uh, obviously speech when you know it's unnatural to do that mm. uh, was it a bit uh, did you go on the limb was it a bit risky how did you feel 
uh, yeah, it was a bit weird. Like, but it was. It, I felt safe at the Bible study, and you know, yes, yeah. I was just, I was just went for it. I remember just going down on my knees. I was, I was just like, yep. But it was. I was. Tr- I was trying too hard. I think yeah. at first I had to, like, it was just Rest letting letting the tongue just just mumble whatever, and then, and then once you know, opening opening my mouth, and then once it's just like then the Holy Spirit just kind of just takes over. So yeah. do you think this is real? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So it's not made up. It's it's no, not it a bit the gospel thing or anything like and that. And it's in the Bible too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Of course. So it's an experience to be had. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's and as what did said, it trigger in you? The, the the Holy Spirit feeling. Um it was a passion and a, it was a it was a heart for God. It was mm-hmm. a real um a fire, a fire for God, like ignited. Mm-hmm. Um, it was already igniting, but it really took off, you know. Um, and uh, it can t- like it started off like kind of like there, like mm-hmm. but this tiny little thing, and then it it's like over time, it kind of just goes over your your whole body, yeah, and your whole everything, and um, and it's it's like yeah, it's just a a piece that can't can't be explained. The deep deep love of Jesus, it's just yeah, it's it's um, it's what I was searching for in drugs. I think it really uh, brings home the message that you're a son. Mm. It cements, it seals that adoption, mm. I think. And you also started the Australian School of Ministry about that time, or a little bit earlier. Mm. Uh, and you finished that in record time, 10 units in seven months. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have anything else to do. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to do anything else. But actually. you stuck to it. Uh, that must have taken quite a bit of discipline. Yeah. It wasn't actually an effort. It no. didn't. Um, no, it wasn't. I was. I, was, I just wanted to do it. I was ready. I. I um, Did you enjoy the lessons? I loved it. Yeah, yeah, it was perfect. It was exactly what I needed because it was in. I wasn't. I wasn't in a church like yeah. with um, you know two hundred other um, people kind of distracting me. Yeah, I was. It, you know, I was doing the lectures online. Um, in my own home, I, I was I could prepare myself to receive it, like yeah. in a, in my own way. Um, it wasn't someone telling me, you know, you got to do this, you got to do that. Yeah. I was just go at your own pace, like. Yeah. And my own pace was to do it in seven months, and um, like because. And on the day you, on on the Sunday you graduated, and on the Monday you went. Started uni. Started uni. Mm. That was uh, what April or sometime this year. Started yeah. this year. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm. You know, you you went on to your bachelor, and they gave you a nice uh, one year off exemption yeah. as well. So they yeah. recognised your prior learning, which yeah. is wonderful. And uh, something again, something beautiful happened as well with uh, your biography. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so I uh, wrote like. The story of coming to to Jesus um, in a book from um, drug with with your help obviously like um, like you know I remember it, like going for a run and then running up past you like yeah. you know I believe that God said I'll write a, write your story down Paul um, in a book and and I, someone said to me you know if you think you hear from God run it past someone that you can trust so I ran it past you and then um, then you were like yes. Absolutely, you do it. Yeah, yeah. And so I started writing, and yeah. um, and you encouraged me along the way. So it was great to have it, it to go to someone the mm-hmm. the chapters, and um, and that was so that was November last year. So it's been it's been a the my, most of the words came out in about a month. One well, um, the rough draft, and since then it's been it's been um, you know, edits and lots of people have helped, and so it's just. Yeah, so I hopefully, who knows what will happen. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be really soon. Hopefully, yeah. when we broadcast this uh, this show, it'll just be maybe released by then, mm. hopefully, with the shipping and everything that's going on in the world at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's the book about? So it is your life story, just so, for our, our audience? Yeah, so it's just about, um, you know, most, like being a drug addict and then journey to finding God, finding yeah. Jesus, yeah. Title? Uh, mended, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mended. Me ended. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. What What does mended for, mean for you? Uh, means a lot of things. 
like it's a quirky title, which I like. Mm-hmm. It's not, uh, it's just like Mended, you know, me ended the wordplay. But Mended, it's, um, uh, it's like, because it's, it's a mending as well. Mm-hmm. It's, a, so it's, but it's Mended, but it's also a mending. Yeah. So it's like, it's, it's, um, it's a con. It's like a. It's a, it's a. It's a. It's a full stop, but it's also a dot dot dot. Yeah. Yeah. So it's and it's a, you know, having that, you know, having the book in print, it kind of holds you to it too. Yeah. Um. So you know, rough days. It's like if you, you know, if you put it out there for everyone to see, um, and you start, you know, going off track. You know, it could work two ways. You, you could completely go into, yep. um, you know, isolate, but people could start pulling you back. You remember, like, look at this chapter. Yeah. That's, didn't you write that? Like, Well, it does uh, put some responsibility on your shoulders, mm-hmm. but, it, but it's a healthy responsibility. It's a holy fear. Yeah. And we need to have that anyway. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm amazed. I'm amazed that you've written it in such a record time and uh, you had the patience to go through the, hard work that starts after the book is written mm. and uh, we've come a long way. Yeah. Having, having people critique you or having your, cause I thought it was, I thought it was going to be a bestseller just one time. <laughs> 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 just, just, I was like, this is going to go, this is going to be an international hit. Yeah. Um, just the first cut, the first take, yeah. but then it kept on coming back and yeah. it kept on, and it's like, Oh, you know, like I've got some family members to look at it and, so it's it was a it was a sharpening and it was a um, strengthening with people saying yeah. like no that that's probably not good to put in yeah. or like you know that you need to sharpen you needed that yeah yeah and to, to totally kill the ego <laughs> yeah and it's con- and it's continue continuing to be killed yeah, yeah. it's an ongoing like yeah. what's your life like at the moment um it's um it's good. It, it's it's extremely um uh like beyond what some days like I feel really um out of my depth mm-hmm. with a few a few things um when I start thinking about it yeah you know when I start thinking about it it's like whoa like where am I kind of thing yeah um worry about you know what people might think or this or that but then when I just let go and just put my eyes back on God it's that all washes away and it yeah. and it's so you know when I when I'm looking at God and I and I'm trusting in God and I'm I'm listening and um you know seeking counsel and all this sort of stuff everything is exactly where it needs to be yeah when I start thinking about it and I start worrying then you know it's it's a chain reaction yeah so um but it's my life is you know one year ago like no six months ago if I had like stopped if I you know. If I died six months ago, I would have been happy. Like, yeah, you know what I mean. Like, yeah. my life was—I've done more um, healing over the last year than I ever would have thought. Like, I'm at a stage, um, in a sense of have being i don't know how to put it without sounding um, like like a huge ego. Before I took drugs, you know, when I was a kid, I yeah. feel like I'm back there. Yeah. yeah. Like an innocence. Yeah, you know. you're cleansed, you're restored, yeah. you're fully restored in a way. Yeah. You're still work in progress, but Absolutely, yeah. you see the the finishing line. You see mm. yourself above mm. the line. You're not below the line. Nowhere yeah. near below the line. And things things are like, it's like a kid. It's like doing things like, um, you know, being there for someone, like, you know, going to a family member's house and being there and actually being interested in their life. Yeah. Not it's just like, about you. Like it's not just about yeah, you. Yeah, I can't believe it. It's yeah. like I'm actually here having this conversation, and I actually care. Yeah, it's like you, it's not you know, yourself. It's that's living for me. Yeah. That's 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 being um that's a new life for me. Yeah, I never because it you know thirty odd years of not doing that. It's like yeah. So what's next for Paul Mansfield? Um, just to maintain, just to maintain the the the, the direction. Just keeping to, your eyes and focus. Yeah, carrying on to to continue. I've always I have generally in the past been a good starter, mm-hmm. and so it's the grunt work I think starts now. This is this is where it really starts. Um, 
is you know it's you know it's been a bit, the 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 purple cloud you know the gray the good the, the first love patch um but it's really really just um digging in and just staying true to the the course i think um is where is what's next wonderful mm. what's the legacy you'd like to build uh, you know this question is <laughs> going to come so. <laughs> um, Oh, I don't. I'm honestly. Um, I'd like to be known. Obviously, someone that um, someone that turned their life around through God. Mm -hmm. Um, but sort of like a, I love to be um, known as someone that cares for their his friends and family. Yeah. Uh, for those closest to him, someone yeah. with integrity. Uh, that's uh, that doesn't that doesn't compromise. Mm -hmm. Um. That's and someone that you can rely on. Yeah. Yeah. Someone. It's all that you weren't before, in a way. Yeah. Everything they. So that's the turnaround in Christ, isn't it? Mm. All that you wish you were, but you couldn't be. Now yeah. you are. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Mate, I've learned so much from you and from the journey. And I really consider it a, a joy to have journey with you. And just to see the fruit of Christ's labor. Mm. And uh, I mean, for me, I was just a postman. I was just basically not even resisting what God was doing and just allowing things to happen. I think they happen in in God's way, in God's time. And uh, I, I don't consider I've done a lot. Mm. I just showed up, basically. And I think sometimes that's what we got to do. We got to show up. Because mm. when we show up, Christ is in us and it happens. Things happen. Uh, but, um, you know, you invest in many people like us in ministry, we invest in many people and not all of them make it. And with some people I've journeyed for, you know, much more than you, mm -hmm. uh, several years, in fact, and they haven't shot through yet. You know, they haven't gotten very far because they just stubborn and they don't want to work with the Holy Spirit. So I was, um, I'm, I'm happy. I'm enthused. I'm joyful you know, of your progress and well done. Thanks. And well done for, you know, listening and following and, you know, putting up with me because I mean, I can be unpleasant at times as well, you know, and irritable, but somehow we, you know, I think we get each other so well. And also I want to honor you and thank you for, you know, supporting me in the church and helping me out. And, you know, I can rely on you. And, um, I just got to say to the guys as well, I mean, to the, our listeners and those people who watch this show, uh, you know, you're doing this voluntarily. You're, you're helping us voluntarily. You're filming this and you're showing up and not just for this show, but for the other podcasts, a bit of clarity in both mm -hmm. languages, Romanian and English, which is, a, a, you know, an industrious amount of work. I mean, the, the, the amount of work that we put in week in, week out is is huge mm. you know most people couldn't even comprehend you know we're, we're here every sunday morning before most people wake up and we yeah. film for two three hours at a time it started four or five hours and now it's just because we've come such a long way mm. so thank you no worries thank yeah. you paul i honor you and i thank you and uh just to cap off year 2021 with you i think it's just beautiful because it's it's a pinnacle mm. we finished 2021 with uh, a beautiful story with a high note Okay. Well, <laughs> I bet you didn't expect that at the end of this year to hear this and watch this and hear this beautiful story. I'm sure you have people in your life um, on whom you probably gave up or people who have gone astray or have fallen deep in addiction. Let me tell you that there is hope. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And there is restoration, full restoration in Christ Jesus. You see Paul's life and what the Lord has done in his life and how he turned his life around. And in record time, after him surrendering to the Lord, you saw um, the fruit of, of that turnaround. He's restored. He, you know, he's committed to the Lord. He walks with God. He's full of the Spirit. He wrote his autobiography, finished Bible college. He's doing a bachelor at the moment. Uh, studies, uh, you know, undergraduate studies. And it's just amazing what God is doing in his life. And uh, 
this shows that there is hope, there is possibility, and beyond any circumstances that people face, don't give up on those people you love. Just keep praying, send them, help them go to a rehab center, Christian rehab center where they can grow and uh, walk with them and spend time. Love means spending time. I mean, if, if you look at the time Paul and I spent together in the last 12 months, 15 months, uh, you know, most people couldn't find that time during the week. But we, we probably spend, you know, anywhere between, you know, five to 10 hours a week together in various uh, circles in various ministries and what we do together but that means you know uh, we're doing life for life which uh, you know I'm accountable to him he's accountable to me we speak into each other's life there is feedback and this just helps us grow together as a spiritual son and spiritual father because life is so so important well season one of Kingdom Stories from Down Under is about to finish uh, it is uh, 31st of December now, almost um, year 2021. The COVID year, which has affected us, and you've survived and we survived. Thank you for coming on this journey with us from the beginning of the year and enjoying these beautiful stories. And I really hope that uh, they have inspired you and they have produced a lot of joy in your heart. Do share this uh, content with other people. And we pray that you have a safe break and holiday and we will see you in season two of Kingdom Stories from Down Under. Lord bless you. Thank you for joining us on Kingdom Stories from Down Under. We'd love it if you would subscribe, rate and share these stories with your wider community. And remember, every story is worth sharing, including yours.